Coming up on Theater Talk. It's one of the great things about people who go mad and people who go to the dark side is they have a really good time. If it wasn't fun, they wouldn't do it. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And Susan, there is a, um, a haunting and, and beautiful new musical off-Broadway at the Vineyard Theater That's called sweet. The Landing. And it has one of the best scores, uh, new scores I've heard in a long time. And why would it not? Because the music is by the great John Kander. Welcome back to Theater Talk. Thank you John. very much. Uh, writing um, uh, without uh, his great partner, uh, much missed and beloved Fred Ebb, but you found um, uh, a very talented young person to uh, collaborate with on this. Greg Pierce, who has done the book and the lyrics to The Landing. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. Uh, who is related to, of course, one of the uh, great uh, stage actors uh, working today, our good friend David Hyde Pierce. You and know. your uncle, what's the... Yeah, yes. my brother is his dad. Your brother is right. right. And David's in, in the landing. Yes. Uh, of course, sorry. Yeah, yes. right. <laughs> yeah. Hello. <laughs> yeah, David's in the landing. Yeah. And a beautiful, beautiful production directed by our good friend Walter Bobby. Welcome all to... Uh, Thank you. Welcome to Theater Talk. So how did you guys get together? Uh, well, we both went to Oberlin College. That was the connection. Mm -hmm. um, Did John, you write him a fan letter or something like that? No, no. John was uh, active with um, uh, helping helping out students who were at Oberlin coming to New York to pursue careers in theater. So there were, uh, I was the writer, there were some actors, uh, musicians, and so uh, after I came to New York, um, we just, I just shared writing with him. We stayed in touch. I went to workshops of his uh, shows, and ten years later he asked me to, to write a show. Really, what did you see in his work that uh, well, inspired you to, to bring him along? Well, to start with, he's one of the most talented writers I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, I've read lots and lots of short stories of his, as well as <clears throat> uh, observing some theater stuff. And it's hard to explain. Uh, if if uh, for composers, or at least this composer, you, you read with your ears, which is a hard thing to do, but uh, <laughs> you hear what you read. Right. And uh, You hear music in the... You, you sort of hear the sound of the, of the words. And I, I read so much of Greg's work, and, it, and I heard it. Mm. Anyway, I'll try to keep this brief. One day I was sitting in my studio, and I found myself saying, literally, what do I feel like writing? And I remember I even stood up when I thought of it. I said, I'd like to write something really tiny for four actors and four instruments that you could, so small that you could do it in your living room. Mm. And uh, the first person I thought of discussing that with was Greg, mm. because he's master storyteller, mm -hmm. among other things. And basically, it's as simple as that. We started talking, and we started playing What If uh, on this story, which became the first story in, in our musical. And we began to find working together very easy, a, a different kind of easiness than with Fred, but we began to develop what I think is our own voice. Mm. Do you still work around the kitchen table as you used to work around with well, Fred? Uh, actually, we work up uh, in the country a lot, and uh, we, we work on our phones. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new way of doing a musical. Yes. Well, it's, uh, we should say for uh, people who have not seen The Landing, it is, it do, it's a collection of short stories almost in a way, three um, uh, different um, uh, chamber musicals, if you will, with these fascinating twists uh, on them. Uh, David, did you recognize the talent early on as part of the family? Was he writing these short stories that you read when, when he was growing up? Yeah, I, well, I don't know about when you were growing up, but uh, certainly after college, I remember seeing sketch comedy uh, that, uh, that Greg had been part of and uh, then reading his short stories and novels. And uh, um, it was clear that he had uh, not only a lot of talent, but a, a unique voice. 
Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that really comes out in this piece. And uh, um, he has a great ear for language, um, and uh, which translates into a great ear for lyrics, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't always happen. And, uh, and also there are some great humor, but also some very uh, sort of unnerving, dark turns that things take occasionally. Yeah. Yes, it's well. disturbing. And, and, and things you don't expect to have in you. This is not a predictable. No, there's definitely a Rod Serling that. quality to some mm -hmm. of your work. Mm -hmm. And what was your attraction to this, uh, to this material, Walter? It was good material. Yeah, but that'll, do it, that'll do it. Well, <laughs> you know, the chance to be back in the room with John Kander at this point in, in, in this extraordinary you famously career. famously did the great revival yeah. of Chicago. And also, I just read uh, Greg's stuff, and I was astonished at the economy, mm -hmm. the insight and the economy of his writing. And uh, in fact, the other day we had this situation where there was the end of one scene, which I thought was resolved too quickly in the beginning of another scene, which didn't quite, and I had all of this, I went on and on about how this might be solved. And then Greg solved it with five lines, you know? <laughs> and uh, so it's amazing how he's able to distill complex psychological situations or narrative situations and achieve uh, a transformation very elegantly, very simply. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable. And this is all original material. I mean, is, is this based on any short stories that you've written before? No, we wrote the stories forward? together. Uh, we came up with them together. Uh, we, we, when he asked me to do this, we were just doing a one act, you know, and we wrote the first piece, Andra, and we, as John said, we sat around and played What If, and just the story evolved. And then um, John took the material to a friend of his who said, uh, why not make an, an evening of it? And so we came up with the idea of two, more, two others, um, both with narrators. We were interested in narrators who were sort of re really inside the story and some who were sort of outside. Um, but we, we wrote the stories together. And the vineyard... Uh, Which is kind of your home now. Yeah, it is. I really think of it that way, and so does Greg. Uh, they gave us a reading on the first one and helped us uh, with the idea of turning it into a larger piece. And we, we spent a lot of time down in that basement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> did, no, did, I don't... Did, did you have to audition for your nephew to get the job? <laughs> no. Uh, fortunately, I used a family connection. <laughs> I got yourself so, in there. Yeah. But were, were you, you with... thinking of him when you wrote these, these parts? When we wrote the first one, we were thinking of him. You were, yeah. right. Yeah, I think maybe not in the very beginning when we started The to first play. piece, no, I don't think. No, but in the second piece, were you thinking of him? Yeah, yes. so we did a workshop of the first piece, yes. and, that, and he was in that. Yeah, and yeah. then we had these, uh, these great actors and started to write with them in mind. Yeah, right? yeah. well, yeah. you could say that the, the second piece, which is really quite fascinating, called The Brick, and quite disturbing. You're, you're terrific at it. I mean, I, 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 mean, I know you're a musical comedy guy, but I never knew you could be <laughs> this menacing gangster, too. I mean, oh, no, don't give away. It, well, all right, it's, but it's, 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 it begins as Guys and Dolls, and then it becomes Goodfellas. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, that's funny. <laughs> I think that's what you're going for. I mean, yeah, that's, well, that's, that's part that's of the, that was a, a large attraction for me in the pieces, because they're it, not stylistic, but they're so different. Yeah. And it was a wonderful, sort of a real uh, a festival for me to get in there with three distinctly different pieces. But they're all connected. But they're all connected, yes. Yes. You know, they're all from the same well, but they came up in three different buckets, is how I feel. So that, uh, and the other thing was to hear, to hear a completely new voice with John. It's not hmm. another Candor and Ebb, it's Candor Pierce, and I heard that immediately, and that really caught my ear. Is this the, is, is Greg the first person you've really written a whole show with uh, yes. since Fred died? Really? Have you attempted with anything with anyone else? Or? No, it's, it's every other, uh, all the pieces that we've done since Fred's death were pieces which were working started on. and uh, which I just uh, brought to conclusion with, uh, no, this is the first person I've, as his first person I even ever asked to work with. Mm. That's very heady stuff for you, isn't it? I know. It? I, you're, you're surrounded by, uh, you know, legends here. And I know you've yeah. got the family connection already, so you're used to him. But, I mean, yeah. you must pinch yourself and think, geez, I'm working with John Kander and Walter Bobby. I do think that. I mean, were you <laughs> intimidated at first when w working with him? I was not intimidated uh, because we, we had known each other for 10 years. Yes, and, and we're good friends. And, um, but um, but I, I never lost sight of the fact that it, it's an incredible thing. <laughs> 
And, uh, and the vineyard, the great thing about the vineyard, if, if you've been there, is that, um, you know, you, there's an entrance sort of in the, in the ground floor so you can look up at all the seats. And I, look, I, I walked in during tech rehearsal and looked up and that, there was John and Walter and Dave and all our, John Lee Beatty, all our incredible designers, <laughs> yeah. you know, in this basement. And, and you just, it just, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> was, uh, it, was it an attraction for you to work with someone as, as young as Greg is? I mean, were you? I don't think I ever thought about it. Uh, everybody else has, but, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can say we went to school together only 50 <laughs> years different. <laughs> yes. uh, no, it it, it 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 sounds weird, but I never for a second thought of a anybody else or isn't this strange that I should be working with somebody so young? Mm. He's just f talented. <laughs> also, Greg is old for his years, and Cantor isn't. That's very funny. No, uh, and very and, and you because you certainly you, the you, your music could be written by a young composer that you hear in the, in this score. Mm -hmm. You're not approaching it the same way as as you are other scores. You you're you're you, 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 you know what you know what else that I, I I was struck by is that when <clears throat> John and Fred wrote together, they were always adapting someone else's material. So mm -hmm. there was at least one other voice in the room, whether right. it was the book writer or the original source. And the difference with this material is there is no other source. The source of these, all of these stories is Greg and John. They are not adapting anyone else. So there is immediately uh, a kind of just emotional texture, a, a, a lyric, a poetic poetry. I think I find these pieces incredibly poetic. Yeah, I mean, I must say, and, and the poetry is in the music too, because, I mean, you know, you famous for the great real, that the sh fabulous showbiz Mm -hmm. musicals that you did with Fred, you mean really defining an era of Broadway, and uh, this is, um, I mean, I, w I don't want to be cruel to uh, people who aren't here at the table, but let's say that there are certain younger composers who write very prettily but without any tunes. You write prettily with great tunes <laughs> throughout the whole thing, you know. Well, we, we hit on a sort of language, the two of us, very early on when we were writing the first piece or making up the first piece, and it, it had to do not so much with writing songs, but with writing music and words happening all at the same time. And sometimes somebody sings mm -hmm. a line, and, yeah, yeah. and sometimes they don't. There's music going on underneath dialogue. There are sometimes little two-line songs. I don't know how to explain it. Mm. but It's seamless, though. The, the music whole... never stops. Yeah, I yeah. mean, there's sections where the music never stops. It's it's hard to do a recording of this without actually recording right. the entire You record the right. whole thing. But now, when the actors came in, were you still developing the material? I mean, as a, David, as an actor, were you part of, of shaping, your, the, shaping the things you were singing and speaking, or was that all there? Uh, only in, in the sense that my limitations probably <laughs> uh, shaped what, what was right. But I think, you know, we were brought in, the group of us, uh, uh, Julia and Paul and uh, uh, me and, and uh, now are the young boy Frankie, uh, who's in it, who's so great. But we were part of the first reading, um, not Frankie because he was too young. Yes. But uh, and then, as as Greg said, they sort of wrote for us in the subsequent pieces. But I, I can't say that in my recollection that we had any or needed to have any particular input in how it was shaped because it was uh, coming out of their brain. Oh, I want to add, as your Tony Award-winning part in Curtains showed us you have a very wonderful singing voice. <laughs> yeah, he he's does a, indeed. He's, he's a stealth <laughs> musical comedy leading man. He does. He's, uh, we, we have to wrap it up soon, but I want to put John on the spot by asking you guys about John. What, Walter, you've worked with John for a long time. I mean, he really is one of the great composers in the history of musical theater. What continues to um, impress you, amaze you about his, his talent? I think it's what David said. He's just, he's still young. I mean, you have a meeting, and you say, what about this? And I was thinking, and he just dashes over to the piano. He says, you mean this? And you go, oh, no, I didn't mean anything quite that good, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that's been, and there's been, a, at this point, there's been a great playfulness, don't you think, yeah. in the rehearsal process in terms of tweaking the show and refining the show and John's willingness to just open up to, uh, to any idea in the room, and he knows when he doesn't like the idea, and he knows when he's ready to embrace it. Mm. And he always makes it better than I expected. And how does he convey to you guys that if he, if he doesn't like the idea? He says, no, that's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what that allows? It allows us to say, no, that's not a good <laughs> idea, too. <laughs> i got to say, that that's, that's true for both of these guys, yeah. that they are the sweetest you know, guys around. Uh, 
and very generous, but they also know, they, they have great ears, and they know when it's not right. And whether it's a word that right. uh, needs to be changed, or words that's not being said, or, or something about a phrase or an orchestration, uh, and it's very bracing and wonderful um, to hear someone say, no, this is how it needs to be, because you realize, oh, it really matters. Yeah. Right. So are you working on the next one? We are. We're developing another one at the Vineyard. Ah. So, yeah, we, uh, we've done a couple of workshops, and we're, we're well into it. So. Okay. Actually, we're starting on a third. Wow. My gosh. I figured I'm 86. I'd better hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> you do not look like you're 86, John, i got to say. It really you look great. Well, I, I have to say this, and I don't know how to say it properly. I feel that I am the luckiest man in the world. <laughs> Uh, to to have this kind of new world to play in, a new sandbox, wonderful people, and uh, who could be who could be luckier than that? With Fred's looking, probably looking down, right? He's got a few unpleasant things to say. <laughs> 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 All right, the show is called "The uh, Landing," a new musical by. Uh, Greg Pierce and John Kander, directed by Walter Bobby and starring David Hyde Pierce at the Vineyard Theater. Don't miss it. Terrific, terrific new musical. Thanks a lot for being our guest on Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. That's our son. That's our son. And he's here. And he's playing. Michael, there's a big new revival of Macbeth at Lincoln Center Theater. Yeah, directed by uh, Tony Award winner Jack O'Brien and starring Ethan Hawke uh, in the title role. And but what's the, what's the unique take on this? I mean, we've seen a lot of Macbeths lately. What is Jack doing with this production? He's got wonderful actors in it, and including Malcolm Getz, John Glover, and Byron Jennings playing the witches. Susie Evans from Backstage and I went over and we talked to the actors at Lincoln Center, and we're gonna show you some of that right now. Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. How's everything going? It's awesome. I mean, it, you know, to try to break these plays down, it's one thing to read them and, you know, you, even as a student or whatever, you get this play in high school and you try to understand it, but to try to make it sing is really difficult and really exciting. And when it does, when you hear it come to life, uh, it's thrilling. You said what did I that say? you oh, no. had postponed, you, that you, when you were young, you thought you didn't want to play Macbeth because you thought you might go crazy. <laughs> now, I think any sane actor <laughs> yeah. would be worried about going crazy so, playing so this role. So is that prediction, is that, is that trepidation proving true? Are you going a little crazy playing Macbeth? No, the truth is I'm in an incredibly fortunate situation because uh, I have, to my mind, one of the greatest minds on Shakespeare Alive on the Planet as my director. Yes. And, you know, he really changed a lot of that because about that whole outlook for me because one of the great things about people who go mad and people who go to the dark side is they have a really good time. If it wasn't fun, they wouldn't do it. This Macbeth is having fun? I don't mean it quite literally like that. What I mean is if sin were all dark and painful, all of us would be much better people. You know, Chasing after what you want and satisfying your own desires is something that a lot of us look down on and still do. And so trying to access the part of him, why somebody would do this. They don't do it to torture themselves. They do, you know, megalomania, um, egomania, narcissism, whatever all that, it feels good when it's working. Can you tell me something that will give me some sympathy for Lady Macbeth? I can. Um, I think what's a beautiful, What's well, been a beautiful point of concentration in this production so far, and I think we're certainly going to adhere to that, is that we are really focusing on the fact that these two people, these two people really love each other. They love the bones of each other. And so, as a result, every action, every crazy moment and entry into a parallel universe that happens thereafter is born out of love. And so, there's a... A romantic love. Yeah. There's a residue of that, which means that you feel more engaged with it, you care more about them as individuals. And I think, um, I think that's been very interesting. So it's not such a sort of Machiavellian, Machiavellian relationship. It's, there's, more, there's more to it, it's more profound than that. I think basically it's a nightmare. 
I think basically it's a sort of mythic meditation on, on addiction, on di all kinds of addiction. Um, it's, you know, addiction to power, addiction to success, addiction to privilege, addiction to sex, addiction to drugs. Um, I said to Ethan, I want you to think about somebody like Tom Brady winning the Super Bowl and arriving absolutely swollen with adrenaline, at which time you think to yourself, I could do anything. And that's when you take your first drink, your first toke, your first cigarette. You make your first mistake thinking you're invulnerable. What about her? Well, she's a willing partner. They, you know, oddly enough, it's the best marriage in Shakespeare. They're a happy couple. Right at the beginning, he loves her. He brings that tre treasure home to her. She, they work together. But if they're happy, then why isn't that enough? Because if you make the wrong choices, you have to be responsible for them. I mean, if you're, if you're happy, then do you, why do you need to gra grab power and kill people to get it? Because your instinct tells you you deserve it because you're, you, you're swollen with, an, with your own hubris. I'm King Duncan. Oh, and what? Three scenes is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> scene two, scene four, and scene six, and then I'm out. <laughs> what do you dead. do? What do you do while you're dead? Uh, I should think go for a walk. Yeah. Finish off the crossword. What's the best piece of advice that you have for playing Shakespeare? Uh, do the music. Yes. No pauses. One believes that that's the way his mind worked, Shakespeare. Because he wasn't an intellectual, he was an actor. You know, a country boy, bumpkin, basically. So it, it's all very simple, it's not, it's not fancy stuff. And he was hearing the music. Yes, oh yes. Do you believe in this concept that he was like receiving some kind of uh, greater, some kind of higher power of talent? No, I think what he was doing was he was a, a country boy with a great genius who needed to write plays and uh, they needed another play so they were saying please you, uh, can we have another play and so he would write it yeah. and that's why and then he because it's interesting that, that that he quit and uh, but I think that that figures in that concept that he just he'd done it and the deadlines were over Yes, and uh, there was nothing more to be done, and uh, so he went home to Stratford and ran his newspaper or whatever. Oh, when I was coming over here, I was trying to figure out who was playing what when I saw that you three great actors were in this play. You're the witches. Yes, indeed. We're sisters. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, the witches were played by boys originally, I'm sure, right? Of course. Yeah. Shakespeare's there. Yeah. They would have or, been men. Or, or men. Yeah, yeah. And actually, Banquo says, the first time he sees the witches, he says, I would call you women, but you have beards. So there's, there's something there. So how are you, what's your prep for this? How are you working on it? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> it would be censored. Are you having seen <laughs> I think we are still, certainly still exploring. Yeah, we're in the middle of the maze right now, trying to figure our way in and out. Yeah. So it's that um, time in rehearsal, you know? Things kind of come together and fall apart and come together. It's very exciting. Uh, I play Macduff. Macduff. And Macduff, yeah. He's, what's his problem? Um, what's his, he's, you know, he, get, he has a lot of problems, and most of them come from, uh, come from good old Macbeth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he gets a chance to even the score at the end of the play. Uh, you know, the play, to me, thematically, it's about the psychopathy of patriarchy spinning out of control. And so it's great to do something that is a classic and that is also uh, socially relevant, um, you know, and only in a very, th and in a only, the, with only the thinnest of veils you know, kind of obscuring the very obvious parallels between the themes of the play and what we're seeing playing out on the world stage right now. So the opportunity to be socially relevant and creatively uh, integrous at the same time, it's, it's so rare in this business, and so I, I look at it as a great boon. Is this a concept Jack O'Brien is talking to you about, or is this something that you're working with? This is something that I think he, Jack hasn't spoken directly to that, uh, but in ways he has. This to me, as soon as I 
uh, realized through my agents that playing Macbeth was, uh, being in Macbeth was going to be a, a possibility for me, immediately I started thinking, wow, how apropos. I play Lady Macduff. Everybody knows that she comes to quite a brutal end. Um, I think she really is a counterpoint in the play. Um, her character kind of represents a, a bit of normalcy in a, a kind of crazy world. And uh, um, obviously she's very unlike Lady Macbeth in, in, in so many ways, especially in terms of her priorities and her, her lifestyle. Any other specific preparation you're doing um, for your role? Um, I was suiting up, showing up, and, and, and doing some thinking, and uh, um, you know, uh, uh, just immersing myself in the world. I think that's a good tip. Suit up, show up, and do some thinking. <laughs> Cher Cherry Jones always talked about the three Ps. She said, be punctual, polite, and... Well, punctual, punctual, polite, and oh, what was the other P? Well, I don't remember. Oh, punctual, no. polite, I'll have to ask her. Punctual, polite, what will the other B one be? Pretty. <laughs> Bra, all right. Very good. All right. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet good you. Good work. Thanks. Prepare. Prepared. That's it. You can sign up for viewer updates at theatertalk.org or you can follow us on Twitter. Our thanks to the friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. <laughs>